Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone. Good evening. Looks like the rain has held off and we've had a nice day. So I'd just like to welcome everyone to the annual meeting for the Centerville Washington Foundation. We appreciate your attendance this evening. So thank you for joining us. It's a nice crowd. First, I'd like to, rec like to recognize two of our elected officials. Uh, Mr. Dale Berry is over there. Mayor, and I just sat down and asked him to stand up. What's <laughs> happening? So thank you very much. We, uh, we appreciate your attendance. We've had a good year. We have, um, our, your board has worked very hard. I think they are a dedicated board. They are, uh, they enjoy living and working and playing in Central and Washington Township. And they are dedicated to making wise decisions that will make an impact in this community. We will introduce them later on. We had a year where we uh, we uh, had grants of about um, I think it's thirty-four thousand dollars that we gave. Uh, we'll take a little bit more about that when Bob comes up in a few minutes. We had uh, requests for a lot more than that, so we have a lot of work to do. We have um, a long way to go. We have high goals for this year, and our anticipation is that we will probably provide grants for over $40,000 this year, so we're making, we're making good progress. We've, we've already, and I, I probably should let uh, Bob t uh, talk a little bit more about grants when he comes up, but uh, we have um, so, many, so many requests for grants coming in that you wouldn't realize how many nonprofits and needy groups there are in the center of Washington Township area. I know every time when I see the members come in, I'm amazed. I think we did, we did the list last year, did some research, there are over 200 nonprofit um, groups uh, in the center of Washington uh, Township area. And so there's a lot of need out there. So without uh, taking more of this time, I'm going to invite uh, Bob Hansman to come up and talk to you about the grants that we've done. I think you'll be uh, happy and impressed with uh, the investment we've made in this community. So Bob, you're next. Thank you. Well, as Mike just said, one of the best things about the CW Foundation is learning how many organizations there are in our community doing work, which frankly, in many cases, we've never heard of before we get the grant applications. Uh, it's truly inspiring. Every time we run a grant cycle, we get you know, all these applications, and sometimes we've heard of the organization, sometimes we've sponsored them in the past, and sometimes uh, we haven't heard from them before, and that can be because we've just never heard from them or because they're brand new. Uh, and there are a lot of new organizations uh, that have arisen. In a typical year, we run uh, two grant cycles, spring and fall, and uh, uh, there's always, like I said, something new, and I, we'll talk about tonight some of those organizations and what they're doing. Uh, last fall, we ran our typical grant cycle, and uh, those grants were announced, but we didn't have time to, uh, we haven't had time to see the people in person because it took place after our, our last annual meeting. So we invited uh, those particular organizations to attend tonight. And I understand a few of the representatives are here. So I'll just uh, announce the uh, names of these, uh, I believe, three organizations and ask uh, their representatives to uh, stand up. Uh, the first will be Feeding Friends at Harmony Creek. And the second is... Uh, for coming. Uh, Girls on the Run of Dayton. All right. And uh, finally, Living Water Lutheran Church. I just saw, here we go. So thank you for coming and, and thank you for all you do and all your work. So those are the grants from last fall and uh, we've just completed our spring cycle grant. This was an unusual cycle for us because we actually ran two different programs, which we've never done before. We ran our normal grant uh, program, which uh, we've, and then we, then we ran a separate grant program that we've called the Community Impact Grant. And the idea there was instead of, uh, instead of giving numerous smaller grants to many organizations, what if we gave one larger grant to one organization in the hopes that they could leverage the larger amount of money and, and do more good with it. 
So because of your generous support, we've been able to do both of those this spring. We, we gave us about $20,000 away in the normal grants, which we're calling the Community Support Grant. And then we, uh, we selected a grantee for the $10,000 Community Impact Grant. So uh, we've given essentially uh, $30,000 away just this spring, uh, which is, I think, a record for us and reflects the growth uh, of the foundation. I'm going to uh, announce the, uh, those, those grantee organizations and ask their representative to come up and uh, when they do so, I'll just describe for you in, in, a, in a brief moment what they intend to do with the money. I wish I could tell you more about it, about them than just a brief sentence or two because the grant applications that we receive are quite detailed uh, and, and go at, at some length into what they hope to do with uh, funds if selected. Um, and, uh, and we appreciate all that detail and I'll just tell you a little bit about it tonight and hope I do it justice. Uh, the first one is, uh, Friends of the Castle. Do we have anyone here from Friends of the Castle? All right. Uh, Friends of the Castle provides a safe haven for adults with mental disorders. Come on up. Yeah. This grant uh, will be used to help maintain and expand their transportation services. Thank yes. You. Thank you. And um, it may interest you to know that the Friends of the Castle uh, have a, a, a small fleet of buses that uh, two buses, I believe, that and they travel some extraordinary number of miles per week. I believe it's 1,824 miles per week um, that they are transporting uh, their their customers essentially around. And so the grant money will be used to support and maintain that that uh, fleet of buses. So thank you. And, and thank you guys too. <laughs> And we're going to, as people come up, we're going to gather them all over there. Then Bob Daly's going to take a photo of them when they're all, when they're all up. The second is uh, Ronald McDonald House Charities of Dayton. I uh, know I, I saw, there we go, Amanda. Uh, this grant will support their mission to provide family rooms inside Children's Hospital and Miami Valley Hospital. Thanks. The rooms that they provide uh, essentially provide many of the comforts of home, such as meals, showers, and laundry facilities, so that parents and loved ones, while they are attending to their uh, sick uh, child uh, or sick patient, they can reduce the amount of back and forth travel between uh, you know, their homes and the hospital and essentially have a more home-like environment uh, while, while they have a loved one in the hospital. So thank you. TJ's Place of Hope. Oh, great. Hi there. <clears throat> this organization provides a safe, confidential support center for teens caught in the grip of addiction. The grant will be used to purchase a new computer and printer, which will support their accounting and other software programs, as well as to support their website and social media presence. the Centerville Washington Park District. All right. Uh, this uh, grant will be used to uh, partially fund what they're calling Operation Relief. And this is a five-year project, which is an attempt to reforest areas of our, our area that are, were impacted by the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, basically, students from local schools bordering parklands will plant seedlings protected by tree guards in the hopes of replacing a lot of the trees that have been lost. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little lunch. Just a Little Lunch is an organization staffed by volunteers of the Living Hope Church, and they provide free box lunches to underprivileged children. Last year, they gave over 5,000 free box lunches to 25 shelters, food pantries, and churches. Thank you. 
the Centerville High School After Prom Committee. Patty. Good to see you, Patty. Thanks. Patty told me before, the, before uh, this meeting that they've changed their name now and is reflected on their thing. It's called Centerville Late Night, is mm -hmm. that correct? Okay. Great. And uh, this grant will assist this organization, Centerville Late Night, in providing a fun, safe, alcohol-free event immediately following prom, as well as the sophomore spring dance assembly. And Patty wants to stress that you don't have to go to prom to come to the after prom. <laughs> Everybody's invited. <laughs> Hannah's treasure chest. <clears throat> this grant to Hannah's, Hannah's treasure chest will support their beds for babies program, and that provides cribs, mattresses, beds, bassinets, and pack and plays, as well as some safe sleep educational materials for babies and young children. You, uh, Woodland Lights. You all know Woodland Lights, the annual holiday festival. Uh, the grant will be used to maintain and improve that annual holiday display. And I think if you've been there the last couple of years, you can see they've made a lot of changes. Uh, and I guess maybe we'll make some more. So Woodland Lights. Uh, the Washington Township Rec Center. Pleasure today. Oh, all right. You're, you're doing double duty. Okay. Uh, the grant uh, to the rec center, uh, the second grant to the rec center, I guess you could say, uh, is uh, going to fund the training of a staff member as an instructor in nonviolent crisis intervention. This is a uh, particular training program that's put on nationally, and the instructor, after being trained, will come back and provide annual training for 97 staff members on how to manage uh, difficult behaviors. Uh, including uh, uh, managing, uh, for example, children at summer camp that uh, might not otherwise be able to go to summer camp because of behavioral issues. And uh, finally, uh, the um, selectee or grantee for the um, first community impact grant is uh, St. Vincent de Paul Incarnation Conference. And I believe Denny Lamline is here. And this is, this is the inaugural grant of this, and we're gonna try and do it again. In fact, we're gonna do it again in the fall. And this grant, by the way, thank you for coming. Thank you. This grant will be used to establish a getting ahead workshop, which will provide supportive tools for neighbors in need to begin the process of stepping out of generational poverty. So those are the grantees for spring of 2019. And like I said, we're actually going to run the community impact grant again in the fall. We'll be soliciting a grant applications for that. It's gonna be a $10,000 grant, just like uh, this past time. And uh, uh, if you know of worthy organizations uh, who can use the money, and, and I'm sure there's many of those out there, please encourage them to submit an application. I'm going to turn this back over. Oh, actually, Bob's going to take a picture. Thank you. I'll turn this back over to Mike. Bob, thank you very much. 
outstanding job by our, our grants committee and, and by your board. So you can see that the money that you've invested with the Center for Washington Foundation is going to good use. We could have probably had three times as many uh, potential um, nonprofits up here this evening if we could if we could handle that. And as Bob said, we are soliciting your ideas. We'll solicit some other ideas from you later on this evening. Feel free to um, to send any uh, people who are in need our way. Uh, any other ideas that you have um, to introduce? Uh, we meet. Your board meets once a month for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. And we get a lot of things done. But the work behind the scenes is done by committees. Often you can see uh, four or five of us huddled at Panera, one of our meeting places, uh, getting, things, getting things done. So I'd like to introduce the current board members to you at this time. And I will ask them to uh, stand until everybody is standing. So we'll start with Brendan Cunningham. <laughs> and Debbie Dawkins. And of course, Bob Hansman was just here before I came back up. Bob, thank you. Carol Kennard. And Carol is in charge of our events, and she's planned this entire evening with her committee. So uh, everything that's, that's moved, moved uh, smoothly tonight is because of Carol's direction and her planning. So Carol, thank you very much. And a great committee. <laughs> Uh, Paul Labby is not with us this evening. I believe he's traveling. I think he's in where? Africa or someplace like that? If I remember right. Uh, Jack Lobeck. <laughs> Doug Mays. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Kevin McDonald. <laughs> Karen Moon. Nancy Stork, and Karen Stout, we have two uh, ex officio uh, members, Brooks Compton and Dale Berry, which we introduced to you earlier this evening, and then we have three, three emeritus members, which is Sally Beals. Bob Daly behind the camera to my left, and Paul Heinz. I always know when the letters are late coming out, Paul calls me and says, make sure they're going out, make sure I get it. So Paul, <laughs> Paul, thank you. We have a new member, Scott Colwell, who is uh, not here this evening. And we work very closely with the Dayton Foundation, and we work with Carrie Dalrymple there. She's not able to attend tonight either. Um, we have actually three uh, board members who are, um, who are retiring. Uh, first, uh, Judy Buddy. Judy, would you please come up here for a second? After 12 years as a, as a board member, president, she's done everything. She's handled the, uh, the grants. Uh, um, she's handled the um, development side as far as the uh, working with our people there. So we're really, really sorry to see uh, Judy leave. So we're presenting her with a nice vase tonight and some nice flowers for her. Uh, Sally recruited me to the board and she did not tell me at the time that this could be a 12 year commitment, I have to say. Um, but boy, you know, it's been, it's been a lot of time and met a lot of great people and a lot of great people in our community. And it's just wonderful to see how much the foundation has grown and how much we're really working to make a difference in the community. So you'll still see me around. <laughs> Steve Wenstrup is retiring after five years on the board. And I don't believe he's here tonight, but we have a plaque for him, so we will give um, give that to him when we cross uh, paths with him. He's been very instrumental in the marketing side of the foundation. And also we've had one of our members deceased, um, Bob Yek, who has served 10 years 
Uh, he was very instrumental in helping us with all of the mailings, um, and we are, um, we are, we've been missing him since he passed away. So um, keep uh, uh, his family in your thoughts and prayers. So, okay. Um, so I think we've introduced all the board members and all the people that are there. So Debbie, you are on to introduce our speaker. Sorry, they got me a little stool, it would be great. Good evening, <laughs> good evening everyone, I'm Debbie Dawkins. I am very, very pleased to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Frank Kick is a published author and professional speaker who has inspired audiences to kick it in and take the lead since 1986. Since taking an educational leave of absence from teaching at both the public school level, starting in Xenia, then right here in Centerville, as well as at the college level at Wilmington College, Fran has developed what began as a part-time speaking adventure into a full-time professional mission. Today, Fran presents over 100 programs every year across the U.S. and Canada to thousands of college, high school, junior high, and middle school students, and at the Dottie Yet Good Life Award Writing Contest celebration every year, plus the many professionals who work with them. In addition, he works with select association, convention, and corporate organizations who are actively engaged in teaching and reaching kids, speaking at many state, regional, and national conferences, as well as consulting with numerous schools, companies, and organizations. Fran Kick is a boy born in Buffalo, New York whose parents literally pushed him over the top of Niagara Falls when he was only three and a half years old. His mother, Patty Kick, is here in the room tonight, so you can talk to her about that. <laughs> Please welcome Mr. Fran Kick. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, they say brevity is the soul of wit, according to William Shakespeare, and so I'm just going to share a few moments with you here tonight that I've been asked to share about philanthropy and volunteering in your own backyard. Um, and I think the best way to prove my point of everything I'm going to share is in a quick little demonstration that if you'll go along with, it'll make so much more sense when we're done here. So if you have anything in your hands, just set it down for a second. Put your hands out in the air like this with nothing in them. I'm going to say one, two, three, clap, but whenever I say that word, you're going to put your hands together. This will be very simple. One, two, three. Good. Except I didn't say the word clap. Oh, I like people are going, oh, for crying out loud, I messed up. Now, there's a couple people in the room going, didn't get me. He didn't say it. Most of you are sitting there right now going, look, who cares? Well, the point's real simple. It might be the most important point I share with you here today. Your eyes worked a lot better than your ears. That's why you followed instructions with what you saw rather than what you heard, because actions speak louder than words. In fact, we know that consciously, but sometimes we forget that in practice. And the people who study the brain actually say that the connection between your eye and your brain is like high-speed broadband. The connection between your ear and your brain, it's more like dial-up modem. It's just not as good, it's not as fast. And so when we're here tonight just to share some thoughts about how we can look at this thing maybe a little differently than we did before, and I'll share something that I share with many groups when I start because it illustrates profoundly what we can do while we're together. They say you remember pictures a lot longer than words. So if I draw that up there and said, tell you what, how many squares do you see up there? What would be your first answer? Yeah, 16. 4 times 4 is 16. Most of you didn't even count them individually. You just did the math. Figured it out yourself. I'm sure there's a couple of perfectionists in the room going, technically, you didn't draw straight lines parallel to each other. None of them are squares. They're more like quadrilaterals. <laughs> Look at somebody like, what's a quadrilateral? I don't know. But then I heard other answers. I heard a 17 and a 20-something. What was that? 22. Ooh, 26. Very good. Higher than 26? Look at 30. Good. Some of you are looking at it going, what are they looking at? 
Is this a trick? No, it's just the point that you can look at this differently to see different possibilities. Some people, though, have a kind of a closed mind and say, look, there's only 16 squares. That's all I see, so that's all there can be, so that's all there is. Well, other people looked at the big picture and said, you know, the whole thing makes a square, that'd be 17. And then people divide them up two by two, and they get 18, 19, 20, 21. I come here, go 22, 23, 24, 25. There's even one in the middle, 26. But if I look for squares that are three by three, I could find more. I could find 27 and 28 and 29, 30. I didn't change the original diagram at all, but now you see a lot more than just 16. And you'll always see more than 16 because maybe you know how to look at it a little differently than you did before. And that has value. And whenever we get to look at things a little differently than we did before, it increases our understanding, our comprehension, our empathy for what other people are doing or going through. And even as I show you squares that existed, I created the opportunity to find even more squares in that diagram. Well, we could be here quite a while finding all the squares that are there. How many would you find? I don't know. But how many would you look for? And that seems to be the key. Because the more you'd look for, the more you'd find. And the same thing's true in a community. because. We learn things early on in our life that stay with us the rest of our lives, and sometimes we don't even know it. The ABC song would be a great example. Most people learn the ABC song when they're a little kid, and it stays with them the rest of their life. In fact, later on in your life, you'll be volunteering at some event, and someone will say, we got these name tags out. Could you put them in order? And inside your head, you'll be going, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Because what we learn early on in our life stays with us the rest of our lives. Sometimes we don't make that connection, though, till later on. Because that same melody you sing with the ABC song is also the same melody you sing with other songs, like Ba Ba Black Sheep and other tunes that you learned as a little kid, like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Ba Ba Black Sheep, have you any? I never made that connection until I was teaching with a bachelor's degree in music, for crying out loud. And if I had on, I'd be like, whoa, that's the same melody. I, I sung those songs millions of times up to that point, but I never made that connection. And the more we make those connections early on in life, especially when it comes to philanthropy and, and volunteering, it has profound impact on our life. I don't really remember when I was three and a half and my parents pushed me over the top of Niagara Falls. <laughs> but I have other recollections early in my life that made profound impact that maybe even my mom doesn't know that they had that kind of impact. The first one was when I would go to church every Sunday and they'd give all the little kids those tiny little envelopes and you'd put your quarter in there, your 50 cents, and you'd bring it to church and as they passed the basket, you'd set it in that basket. And I remember just the pattern, the habit of doing that every Sunday and, and the opportunity that somehow that is going to add up with everyone else in the church to make a difference somewhere, somehow. I also remember very vividly when I was uh, young elementary school age, my mom told us we were going to donate some toys to a place called Father Baker's Home for Abandoned Boys and, and Unwed Mothers. And I had no idea what that was. Um, but I said, oh, well, we have a lot of toys that we don't play with anymore. Well, that, that's just a great idea. She goes, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to go to the store. We're going to pick out brand new toys and have them all wrapped up and give them to these kids. And I thought, oh, that's great. When are you going to drop them off? She goes, no, no, no. We're going to go and drop them off. And that, even just today, I can still picture pulling up to that place and the, the impact it had. And it was the first time that that saying we use in the holiday spirit, you know, it's better to give than it is to receive, had a huge impact on my life. And being a Boy Scout later on in life taught me the three T's that probably many of you know here. The idea that we can donate our time, our talent, or our treasure to make a difference in this world. And that stuck with me. Fast forward to the point where Judy and I are now raising kids. And I suddenly had this opportunity to kind of plant those seeds in our own kids' minds. And so for many of you who have kids or grandkids, you already probably have done some of these things. But I just thought it was so neat. From the time kids were in their baby seat in the car, we never took them to an ATM machine or the bank to get money. We only took them to the bank to put money in. They thought until they were in middle school, that's what you did, because they never saw us go to the ATM to take money out. And it was just an early impression that we tried to instill in our kids so that they know it's about depositing, it's about saving, in a world where they don't see that lesson a lot. 
The other one was when Anna was uh, in preschool, and um, she got this uh, little piggy bank. And I, this is uh, a poor attempt at trying to share it with you because of uh, space and size. But it was a, a, a piggy bank that we've since passed on to one of our nieces. And it has mama pig and then three little baby pigs. And Lori Mackey created this uh, prosperity for kids. And it's mommy, mommy, mom, mama, mommy and her three little kids. And the idea was to teach the lesson of 70, 10, 10, 10. You know, the idea that what you need, 70%, save 10, invest 10, and give 10. And that piggy bank sat on all our kids' dressers when they were little kids, just to make that point really obvious to them, that it's just not all about you when you're saving. And, and I still remember that Anna's first interaction with like preschool, you know, because there was this thing, this, Christ the King Church, and they had this preschool, and she could go there for three days a week, and so we sent her to preschool, a little apprehensive about it, but okay, and so maybe the second week of preschool, we're having dinner, and Anna turns to Judy and I and says uh, what they were doing at school, and so as she stops and says, Mom, Dad, I want to ask you a question. Why did you have me? I look at Judy, and Judy looks at me, and I'm wondering, what are they teaching in preschool? <laughs> And, and having a sense of maybe this is one of those moments that could be important, I said, Anna, your mom and I decided to have children so that you could come into this world and change the world. And her eyes got huge. She looked around and said, I have to change the entire world? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, well, you already have. You made Judy and I parents for the very first time. She made my parents, grandparents, for the very first time, and anyone who's ever interacted with her, even in preschool, saw that unique spark that she could bring, whether it was dancing, or communicating, or talking, or interacting, that no one else could have brought. And planting that thought that you're here to change the world is an important thing early on for kids to get used to. As they grew up, uh, we made the conscious effort to try to bring more of a, a philanthropy mindset, and so we created what's called a 365 Family Unofficial Foundation. And all it was was our way to pick an organization that we could give a dollar a day for the entire year to kind of make a difference. We never told any about anybody about this. We didn't select applications or do anything like that. But each of our kids had the responsibility to kind of pick or, as a family, talk about, hey, you know, that would be the kind of organization we might want to give some of that 365. And so every year, we picked different organizations and decided to do it. And the only limitation was that it was no public recognition. Because uh, if you follow the Bible, Matthew, uh, the sixth chapter, fifth verse, teaches us that we're just going to give to give, to help. And so that happened as they grew up and went through middle school and high school. And we still continue it to this day, even though they're in college and beyond, as kind of a, a symbol of why that's important for our family and what to do. And you probably have done lots of things like that, too. Um, I still remember hiring the very first babysitter, having this sense of, boy, it's her first job, and I'm paying her money. I have to you know, give her some wisdom. That, like, so I said, here, we're going to pay you this money, but make this commitment to us. Save half. No matter what happens, save half. If every time you get paid, you save half, you'll be in a better position to do more good in this world than if you don't save half. And that was just a powerful example that our kids picked up uh, through just the interaction with that little babysitter that came to the house. Now, you know that there are different levels of how people are motivated or committed. There's the lowest level of things where you feel like you have to do something. And when you have to do something, you're not really very motivated to do it. Oh, you'll do it because you have to, you know. You'll get out of it whenever you can. You'll put it off as long as you can. But the things you have to do in life, you're not really motivated to do it. There's a higher level of motivation and commitment. And those are the things that you get to do. Now, when you get to do something, that's like an opportunity. When you have to do things, it's more like an obligation. And as parents, we use this with kids all the time, right? Some parents will say, hey, you're going to help out around the yard. We're planting some flowers, spreading them all. You're a member of our family. You will participate whether you like it or not. And what does the kid say? Do I have to? Yes, you do. Now, some parents say, you know what? We're going to get this big pile of mulch and plant some flowers. And if you help us out, we'll give you an extra 20 bucks. You can go see a movie with your friend. And they're like, really? I get to? 
So these are the carrots, these are the sticks. These are the bribes, these are the threats. There's a higher level of motivation though. And those are the things that you want to do. Not because you have to, not because you get to, but because you genuinely, intrinsically want to do it. And it might be something like, you've always wanted to learn a foreign language, or you've always wanted to travel to Paris, France, or you've always wanted to write a piece of music, or you've always wanted to create a game, or, or get to a certain level in a video game, or do something with someone across the world. Whatever it is you want to do, you'll move mountains, you'll work through obstacles, not because you have to, not because you get to, but because you intrinsically want to do it. And when you want to do something, you're more motivated motivated on the inside, and that lasts a lot longer. That level of commitment is much higher and stronger and stays with you for a much longer period of time in your life. Now, if you know people who feel like they always have to do stuff, these are the blamers and complainers of the world. These are the people who always make excuses because they have to do stuff. But if you get to do stuff, you're more like a survivor or a get buyer. You figure it out however you have to to get by. But if you want to do stuff in your life, that's where you thrive. That's where you succeed. In spite of obstacle, lack of resources, you create the success because you want to, not because someone's carrot or sticking you. And that kind of motivation is a higher level of motivation. You may have seen it also that different levels of, if you feel like you have to do stuff, you're always dependent. If you feel like you get to do stuff, you're independent. If you want to do stuff, you realize that we're interdependently connected to each other here, right? Think about your own work or livelihood or job. Depending on how you describe it, you might describe it as work, or you might describe it as a career, or you might describe it as a mission. And that's a different point of view on what you do. And that perspective change happens developmentally later in life. It's not going to happen when you're an adolescent. It's going to happen as you emerge into adulthood and maybe even beyond because of something that's fundamentally very important. I'm gonna ask uh, all the people at the table to kind of find a partner who's sitting next to you close by and just shake hands with that partner. So everyone gets a partner, find a partner, shake hands with that partner so you know who your partner is. Does anyone not have a partner? Anyone not have a partner at a table with maybe, you don't have a partner? Partners? Uh, you be my partner. Okay. Come on up, Kevin, this will be very easy. Kevin and I will demonstrate what you're going to do. Kevin, you're gonna hold your right hand up like that? Remember that game you used to play in your little kid, you mirror someone, do whatever they do? That's what's going to happen. Kevin's going to do with his hand whatever I do with my hand, except he's going to watch his hand, I'm going to watch my hand, and we're going to play the game. So watch your hand, I watch my hand, follow me if you would. <laughs> okay, Kevin. We'll work on it. You guys pair up, someone lead, the other person follow, watch your own hand go. <laughs> Stop, switch. Let the other person lead, the other one follow. Watch your own hand, go. And stop. Excellent. Now, Kevin and I are gonna demonstrate how this will work a different way. Instead of me watching my hand and watching his hand, I'm gonna watch his hand, he's gonna watch my hand. And watch what happens. Because your hands are this way. <laughs> nice job. Give Kevin a hand. Thank you very much for playing. One person lead, the other one follow. Watch the other person's hand now. Go. And stop. Switch. Let the other person lead, the other one follow. Watch the other person's hand. Nicely done, give yourselves a hand, you played along beautifully. I always want to video record the audience and then instantly play it back on the screen. Because when you started the game, people are like, well, come on, keep up with me, what's the problem? And you switched and they're like, I'll show you the problem. <laughs> and then I said, okay, now watch the other person's hand. And people are going, oh, wait, I got you, I got yeah, yeah, oh, cool, whoa. And then someone's like, let me try, let me try. Oh, yeah, cool. And you were so much better the second time than the first time because you paid attention to others rather than yourself. So.
I did this at a teacher in service workshop. You know, before school starts, the teachers come in a day ahead of time and talk to the teachers, kind of give them some inspiration. And for some reason, one of the teachers, the daycare or babysitter fell through. And so they had two little kids on the floor in the front row and they were beautifully behaved. And they played along with this game, except they played it like this, <laughs> holding hands. They figured it out. That's kind of what we do here. You're, you're holding hands with other people and other organizations in this community to make it better. And that is a huge win-win. In fact, you've heard of this, that some people are only worried about themselves while other people see the bigger picture and are we us. And if we can get both of those things, right, that creates that win-win. These people are all about their own ego, gratification, whatever it might be. These people are all about the goal or the organization or the mission that we're trying to accomplish. And you know what? It might not be either or. For many people, it's both. But there's a third element sometimes we forget, and it's the world at large. It's that example that we're setting for other people in other places, in other ages, in other generations that suddenly see things maybe a little differently. And when we create success for ourselves and the group and the community we're in and ultimately the world, that might be that sweet spot of success that we plant a seed in someone's mind about how an early experience in our life will emerge later on in life. And it might not happen right away. As I mentioned before, adolescence, that whole period of time you grow up, you're naturally selfish. You're only worried about yourself. You don't care about other people. And I bet you've said that to your kids as they were growing up if you have them. Can't you think about someone other than yourself? Well, no, they're predisposed chemically in their brain to just worry about one thing, survival themselves and how they look to their peers, right? In fact, there was a great study that was done a number of years ago that a colleague of mine wrote a book called Don't Eat the Marshmallow Yet. And uh, the book was based on Walter Mischel's research at Stanford University in the late 60s and the 1970s. And what he did, is he gave every kid in a little room a plate with a single marshmallow on it. And he told the kid, if you can wait 10 minutes without eating that marshmallow, I'll come back and give you a second marshmallow and you'll have two. Now to tell a little toddler kid in preschool to wait 10 minutes for a marshmallow is crazy because the temptation's right there in front of him. And he did this before lunch. So put the marshmallow in front and two out of three kids couldn't wait 10 minutes. They ate the marshmallow, gobbled it up, and that's all they got. One out of three kids could wait 10 minutes, and they got a second marshmallow, and they walked out with two. Now, fast forward to 1988 and then 1990, when he did some follow-up studies on those same students, and almost every indication of success you could pick, SAT scores, grades in school, how they related to their peers or other people, career plans or college or whatever they were pursuing, military, they had a direction, they had a goal. The one of three kids who could wait for the marshmallows seemed to be doing markedly better than the two out of three kids who just couldn't wait and grab the marshmallow right away. Because sometimes that, in, that sense of delayed gratification is something that we experience early on in our life that manifests itself later on in life. And I think the lessons of volunteering and philanthropy are the same way. We learn them early on in our life and they manifest later on in life. And sometimes we don't even see it because we're so focused on something so narrowly, you know? In fact, last little group demonstration. I'd like everyone to make the okay sign if they could with their hand like this. You're gonna hold it out as far as away from your uh, body as you can and point it up in this general direction. What we're gonna ask is this side of the room right here, would you aim that little periscope or telescope actually to this hand and would you aim your periscope or telescope to this hand, got it? So everyone right now has focused on a corresponding hand and I only want you to use what you can see through that tiny little hole you're looking through. Ignore everything else. Raise your hand if you see a microphone in the hand you're looking at. Raise your hand if you see a microphone. Raise your hand if you don't see a microphone in the hand you're looking at. Okay, so obviously half the room, half the room. Now, take that and bring it right up to your eyeball, place it right on your face. Look at the same hand, raise your hand if I have a microphone in my hand. Yeah. Notice how everybody sees it. Why? Because you've broadened your perspective. You're looking at a bigger picture. And if that's what we get to do, is to get people to look at a bigger picture, in a different way, that might be helpful. Especially when it comes to volunteering and philanthropy and how we give of our talent, our time, or our treasure. 
In our brief time together, there's no way I could have covered everything that we needed to cover, but that wasn't the goal. The goal wasn't to give you any answers, it was to help you figure things out for yourself. So when you come across some other situation, you don't look at it and go, well, there's only six triangles there for me, when the truth is, there's so many more. Of course, some people say, well, you didn't show us triangles, you just showed us squares. Squares, triangles, circles, it really doesn't matter because it's how you look at it that makes all the difference in that world. I normally never give a presentation like this. That's why I cheated and made some notes. Because the people who ask me to do it mean a lot. Not just to me, but to our family. We could live anywhere we want in the world doing what I do. Because 80% of the time, I'm on a plane flying somewhere to speak to go do that. I just need an airport. We choose to live here because of all the things you do and the organizations you are involved with do. Because this is, to date myself significantly, a warm and cheerful place to be. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you for having a good message. As you started off with your, uh, with your talk this evening, you made the mention, you said the words profound impact. And that's why we're here as a foundation, to make a profound impact in this community. We recognized 11, 11 nonprofits, 11 charities tonight, and you can ask them if we've made a profound impact in their organization. You can ask Denny about the, the community impact we just did and ask him if we've made a profound impact. Unfortunately, we only, greet, we only get together once a year to talk about and recognize these other opportunities that, that are there. It pains me, I've only been on this board for, I don't know, how long, Jack, three years maybe? So. <laughs> when Kevin takes over in another year, he'll, he'll be able to respond to that. But I, I look in, in the, the book of list every year that the Dayton Business Journal puts out. And I, looked, I look at other communities that have foundations. And I see that their assets are 25 million, 2 million, and things like that. And we're not even to 200,000 200, yet in our assets for the Center for Washington Foundation. And I ask myself, how can we reach out? How can we do more? How can we have that profound impact on our community and be able not just to recognize and help 11 charities, but helping 20 and helping them in more ways. So in, in front of you, you have a card that says hold the date. It says hold the date for September 26th. And on that date, we're going to recognize at our founders event, Harvey B. Smith, the Reverend Harvey B. Smith, who's made a profound impact in this community through the Park District and through Rotary and through the Methodist Church communities. And so what I want you to do is not take one card, but take two cards with you tonight and give it to a friend. Give it to somebody else that can help us make that profound impact. On the back of this card, there are three questions. One is, what are your suggestions for helping the foundation better serve the community? Okay, so take one with you or grab one of the board members afterwards and give them your opinions on this. We need your help. The board of the size of 10, 12, whatever we have here, cannot make all the decisions. We need your input. We're also looking for volunteers to help us in this area. But the last thing is, is that we've worked hard this year on reaching out to a lot of different people. We're reaching out to people and who have, have estates where they want to make a legacy gift. We are reaching out to other, like financial, um, um, uh, uh, financial people that can help us, that can maybe uh, share this with the people who they invest their money with. So those of you that do invest your time, and those of you that do invest um, your treasures with us, we appreciate that. But we need to continue to expand this group. We need to have more than 75 people in this room every year. We need to have more than that. So I want you to take a couple of these with you tonight. But I want you to put on your calendars September 26th, when we're going to have our, our founders, our next uh, founders event, it'll be our 15th annual. Um, Joyce, Joyce Young is with us tonight. Where is Joyce over here? She was the recipient last year. It's good to see her back. <clears throat> 
and she made a profound impact in this community. So I want uh, each of you to take two with you tonight, make sure you share it with somebody, and then come back and join us on September 26th when we recognize the Reverend Harvey B. Smith. Thank you for coming, with, coming tonight. Thank you for investing your time and your, your, your talent with us. Also, I wanted to thank uh, Joe McKenzie of the Miami Valley Communications Council. Joe, it's good to see you again today. Joe and I spent a, a time, um, but this afternoon, taping one thing, and actually you helped us with uh, doing a video on, on the foundation recently, so we appreciate that. That's when Denny was with us, and we recognized that. Um, but I want to thank the, um, I want to thank all the board members for being here. I want to thank all the board members for their hard work. And thank you again for joining us tonight. We hope to see you back on September 26th. Thank you.